we can think of a more generalized version of the budget constraint in this way here. We can say if we're taking any two goods x and y and we're putting good x on the x-axis and good y on the y-axis, then we can say that we can represent the budget constraint by the price of the good on the x-axis times the quantity of the good on the x-axis plus the price of the good on the y-axis times the quantity of the good on the y-axis has to be equal to our income. Technically, we said that the budget constraint is that this has to be less than or equal to income. But when we go to graph it, what we're graphing is actually the boundary of that budget constraint. So we're graphing the part where this is strictly equal to income. And then we said that the slope of our budget constraint was just negative the price of the good on the x-axis divided by the price of the good on the y-axis. We can also say, in general, that if we're going to think about our intercepts on our graph, that our intercept down here is the point where the consumer is spending all of her money on good X, so she can buy a maximum of income divided by the price of good X units of that. Similarly, up here, this represents the point where the consumer is spending all of her income on good Y. And if she's spending all of her income on good Y, she can afford I divided by the price of good Y units of that thing. When we have very straightforward budget constraints, meaning that we don't have any sort of volume discounts, we don't have any sort of buy three, get one free situations, we just have very straightforward unit prices for the items, we can think of our budget constraint using exactly this simple framework that we see here. Sometimes, rather than explicitly considering two particular goods, X and Y, economists instead look at one good X versus this concept of all other goods. So we'll see here that we've put good X on the X axis, as usual, but then we've labeled the Y axis as AOG for all other goods. And we can think of this all other goods category as just having a price that's normalized to $1. So you can say, well, $1 is just the price of a share in this basket of all other stuff. In which case, our budget constraint simplifies to what we see here. We've got the price of the good on the x-axis times the quantity of the good on the x-axis, just like we had before, plus the price of this all other goods share, well, which is just one, times the quantity of all other goods, has to equal income. So we get a slightly simpler form of our budget constraint, and we also notice that we get a slightly simpler form of the slope of our budget constraint. Because we said before that the slope of our budget constraint was just the negative of the price of the good on the x-axis divided by the price of the good on the y-axis. Well, in this case, that's just this all of the goods price, which we said was $1. So this just becomes negative p sub x over 1, or negative p sub x. So when we're defining the budget constraint in this way, the magnitude of the slope of our budget constraint is just the price of the good on the x-axis. And we can see here also, we can think about our intercepts. Our intercepts, as before, is at i divided by p sub x here. But then, if we're spending all of our income on this all other goods basket, and each share in the basket costs $1, then we can buy, at most, I shares in that basket. So the intercept over here is just going to be our income. And you'll see this crop up every once in a while because it's helpful to be able to think about how the consumption behavior of this good X changes in comparison to everything else, rather than just thinking about a world where we only have two goods, such as pizza and beer.